talked about diagnosing the disease of discontent. You remember that? That was kind of... And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul has been building this case for us uh, on the issue of discontentment. And we talked about discontentment. We talked about how the world, the flesh, and the devil are constantly pushing us to be discontent. Uh, We talked about how we are lambs prone to wander. Uh, I gave you an illustration, kind of us being sheep in a pasture. And uh, God gives us a place to, we're saved. He gives us a a city to live in. He gives us a spouse, or maybe we're called to singleness, whatever it is. And there's always a temptation to look out of our social sphere into the pasture next door. And so we're sheep, and we look over the fence, and we look at a friend, a family member, and we're like, you know, I really like what they have. And so we jump over the fence, and we try to build our life to match their life, and then before we know it, we're discontent. We're looking over the fence at another guy or another gal, and it's a never-ending, ongoing onslaught uh, and um, dissatisfaction that the enemy uh, that the enemy pushes us into. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, for example, uh, a young mom may be up to her knees in Lego blocks. And she's scrolling on social media, and there's a newlywed couple at the church, and she's just so desperately wanting to jet set with them around the the country or around the world. And meanwhile, that same newlywed on the other side of the phone is crying tears at night because she can't have a baby, and she desperately wants to to be knee-deep in Lego blocks. At the same time, down the road, there's a man, and he's just got his nine-to-five job, and he's excited about his career. Uh, And uh, he's sad, though, because although the career's going well and he's making some money, he doesn't like going to bed at night alone. He wants a wife, and uh, he's tired of living with his demonic cat, I think is what we called it. Meanwhile, in the condominium above him, there is a, a married man who just got married and tied the knot, and yet he's going to bed at night discontent because he's angry with his wife, and he's wondering if he ever should have been married, and misses chasing the career. And so on and on and on and on it goes. Well, this morning, Paul is going to finish the chapter by like you know, zooming us out big picture. And the reason he does that is to kind of put all this in perspective and say, if you have perspective, then you can, you can be content. Perspective is kind of the antidote to the disease of discontent. And once you see the big picture and you realize there's really no there there, um, that that all of us are going to go through difficulty in life and that there is greater joys in heaven and with the Lord, then suddenly uh, you're able to to relax and to simply enjoy and delight in the station that the Lord has you in. And so this entire message is on perspective. If you've got your Bibles, open them with me here to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 again, if you would join me there. And Let's go ahead and pick it up in verse 25, right where we left off last week. And you'll remember that the eight verses previous to this, Paul's dealt with married life. He's dealt with the categories uh, of relational um, rules. And then after that, he had eight verses on this issue of discontentment and the principles behind it. And now he's going to give us the ability and help us find perspective. And so... If you got your Bible here in 1 Corinthians 7, I'm going to go ahead and throw big point number one up on the screen, just so if you like to kind of have coat hangers to hang your notes on and bullet points, this will help. Paul's going to start off by giving us a view, um, and he wants us viewing our marital status in light of distress, kind of viewing our marital, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're widowed, whether you're divorced, whatever it is, your condition in life, your lot in life, when you got saved, He wants us to start viewing it in light of what he's going to call the present distress. Simply means the challenges, the trials of life. And so you'll see it there in verse 25. He says, now, concerning virgins. And back then that just meant single people. So if you're single, he's talking to you. I have no command of the Lord, meaning this isn't a a right or wrong sin issue. Uh, But I give an opinion of mine as one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. So this is just his counsel. Uh, He's not given commands. Jesus never gave commands on this. This is just him saying, hey, as an older man, a wiser man, a man who walks closely with God, I want to give you a few thoughts on the advantages of, of single life and of the realities of married life. 
Verse 26, I think then that it is good in view of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is, so just to stay single. Now, there's a little bit of debate, by the way, on that as to what the present distress is. Uh, sometimes scholars will say, well, maybe it was a, a local kind of famine in Corinth and it was hard to, you know, to eat and to find food. Uh, also, it could have been just a general persecution that all Christians are kind of promised to go through. Jesus in John chapter 15 said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. If you follow me, they're, just get ready, they're going to persecute you. And so, by and large, if you're a Christian and you walk full-fledged, full force for Christ, at some point people will push back. But then the third view, and probably the one that I would lean towards, is that in about seven, eight years from the moment of this writing, the time of this writing, there's going to be a coming persecution, a literal persecution by Rome on Christians. The Neronian persecution, where he was going to take Christians and burn them at his garden parties for fun. So it's very likely that what you have here is kind of a, the animosity and the anti-Christian sentiment has already began to bubble up. And pause there, we're starting to experience that in our country right now. Christians are called extremists. Christians are called hateful, right? So it could be possible that that's what's happening in the Roman Empire in 57, 58. And that would be a, the present distress. So he says, because of those challenges, because of those trials that are coming, and some of you may actually have to have your children watch your wife burned at the stake or watch you as a man thrown to the lions, because that's coming. He says, it's probably best for you just to stay single. And then in verse 27, he, he kind of clarifies. He says, well, are you bound right now? Are you married to a wife? Well, don't seek to be released. Stay married. But are you released from a wife? Have you already been divorced? Well, then don't seek to get married again. Verse 28, but if you should marry, you've not sinned. It's okay if you do it. And if a single gal should marry, she has not sinned. It's okay if you do it. But here's the principle, kind of the, the heart of his counsel. You ready? It's at the end of verse 28. Yet. He says, it's fine to marry. The men can marry. The, the single gals can marry. That's no problem. It's okay. But such will have what? What's your Bible say? trouble in this life. In the Greek, that's the pressures, the obligations, the responsibilities, the complications. And I love what he says at the end there. He says, qualifier, and I'm trying to spare you. <laughs> My wife doesn't like that as much as I do. And I'm trying to spare you. Now, now obvious principle. Does everyone get it? You get it? Married life is going to be what? It's going to be hard. So he says, you're welcome to get married. And for some of you who have struggles with lust, you're, you're going to need to get married. But up front, he wants everyone to know it's going to be, it's going to be hard. There's going to be stressors involved. Uh, and, and I could prove that with empirical data over the last 20 years almost of ministry. I'll tell you right now, when it comes to the counseling office, talk to any one of the pastors for every one single man, we, we, we talk to 20 married people. The divorce rate itself shows, shows the same thing, right? 50% of marriages end up in divorce. It's hard. Mike Mason says, I'll quote him, he says, quote, angering and humiliating and melting and chastening and purifying. Marriage touches us where we hurt the most in the place of what he calls lovelessness. I remember there was a uh, a couple who, who called us after their honeymoon, they got back, they said, Pastor, it took us about two days on the honeymoon to learn that marriage wasn't going to make us more happy. It was only going to make us more holy. Uh, I said, aha, that didn't take long. So, so needless to say, let me just put this in front of you, Paul's not a romantic. He's not a romanticist, he's a realist. And my daughter all the time will ask me, she's like, it okay, Daddy, if one day I have a husband and he's romantic? I want a romantic husband. I want him to kind of sweep me off my feet. And I tell her, say, hey, that's fine. You can have a romantic, as long as he's also a realist. Because at some point, you've got to pop that rom-com bubble, and you've got to wake up and realize what Paul said. Marriage is going to be, one more time, it's going to be hard. It's going to come with complications and challenges and taxes and in-laws and home purchases and schooling choices. 
and grocery bills in inflation. How many times you had to rework the budget? I guarantee single people care less. Chick-fil-A again. <laughs> Not us, right? So number one, he says, I want you to view marital stress in light of the, the, the challenges, right? And then number two, if you're a note taker, you could put this one for verse 29. He says, I also want you viewing marital status in light of the, the duration, talking about the, the brevity of time in which you're going to be on planet Earth. Look at verse 29. He says, but this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened. The, the time is short that you're going to be alive. The time is short until Jesus comes back. You actually are only going to live for a very small amount of time, five seconds on this ball of dirt. Uh, if you're a football fan, you, you know what the two-minute drill is. That's where at the end of a game, you know, the, 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 you, can't run, you can't run the ball. Basically, you've got to throw it to the sideline. You've got to hit the end zone because you can't waste time because the clock's running out. It's called a, a two-minute drill. What Paul's doing here is a Christian two-minute drill. He says, listen, wake up. There's an urgency here. You're going to die soon or Jesus is going to come back soon and you want to make sure you're living every second of every day for his glory. That's just a, a teaching, a theme across the New Testament, this idea of readiness. Be on the alert. Be ready. He's coming back. And the devil in the world and the flesh says, don't be ready. Go party it up and revel and make it about you. He says, no, you've got to be ready. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says, And this do, knowing the time that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. And by the way, Romans 13, he's saying, don't commit adultery. Don't be an idolater. Be a man or woman who's at the church. Love the brother. And he's saying, and this I want you to do. Why? For salvation now is nearer to us than when we believed. The time is coming when you'll die and you'll stand before Christ. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand, he says. Peter adds, and he says in 2 Peter 3, Know that in the last days, mockers will come with all their mocking. You see this all the time, by the way, online. Following after their own lust and saying, Where is the promises of Jesus? For ever since the fathers died, all continues just as it was from the beginning. There's no Jesus. He's not coming. Oh, everything's always the same. It's been going on and on, century after century. We can do what we want. God doesn't care. Peter goes on and he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. And since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you be? In holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. He says, because he's coming again, because the day is short, because one day the trump will sound, the archangel will call, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are alive and remain will then be caught up to be with him in the air. He says, because that's coming, and one day the entire earth will have a nuclear implosion where he rolls it up like a scroll and he judges the living and the dead. He says, be ready. Be awake. Be on the alert. In fact, let me show you the words of Jesus. Would you turn with me real quickly to Matthew chapter 25? Just go back and look at these famous verses. And you've, you've heard them before, I know. Matthew 25, Jesus is going to the cross and he wants his disciples to remain ready for him. And so he gives them these stories. And one of them, I'll give you the first one, is, is a Hebrew wedding. Remember that? And in a Hebrew wedding, you remember, you would have had uh, the, the, the bridesmaids and they would have went and waited with the, the, the bride. And then one day, they didn't know quite when it would happen, the, the groom would come riding on the horse with all of his groomsmen. Uh, and they would have to wait for him and he'd be building their house. And then he'd come and he would take her away and they'd put her up on a platform and parade her through the town. Wouldn't that be cool? And then they get to his house and there's a massive party before they, they go in and they they finalize the, the wedding. And look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Jesus uses that as an illustration. He says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins or, or bridesmaids who took their lamps. Those are those little first century lamps. I've got one in my office. It's like an Aladdin lamp. And you put the oil in the, the front part and then there'd be a little wick on the little pointy part. And they're holding those. Those are their flashlights. And they would keep those so they could walk around at night. 
He says, the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their little lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. They were waiting, picture that, with, with the bride, and they were waiting for him to arrive. And five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take any oil. But the prudent ones took oil in their flask along with the lamps. And while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and they began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all of the bridesmaids rose and they quickly trimmed their lamps. They put the oil in, but the foolish were out of oil. And they said to the prudent, give us some, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered and said, no, there's not going to be enough for us and you too. Go down to the Walmart and buy some more. Verse 10, and while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came riding in. And those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins, the bridesmaids, came running back, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, read it with me, truly I say to you, I do not what? I don't know you. And then in verse 13, remember parables, Jesus gave a story to make one point. That's what parables are. They make one point. Verse 13, he gives the main point. Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Don't be a foolish virgin. Don't be a foolish bridesmaid. Don't walk around not ready. No matter what you're doing in this life, you always want to have your attentions gazing upward, ready for the moment when Jesus will come for you. It's a short, short, short time that you have on planet Earth. Now, with all that in mind, go all the way back to 1 Corinthians 7 here and look at how Paul uses that to pour on a new perspective a new perspective. You'll see it here in verse 29. He says, but this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened. It's going to go quick. You're either going to die and be cold in a casket or Jesus is going to come and return. Either way, it's going quick. So, verse 29, because of that, from now on, those who have wives should be acting and thinking as though they didn't have any, have one. And those who weep as though they didn't cry. And those who rejoice and feel pleasure as though they didn't rejoice. And those who buy and own as though they didn't actually possess it. And those who use the world and manage their life as though they didn't make full use of it for the form of this world, it's quickly disappearing. See, it's all about perspective. What he's doing is he's giving categories of life there. And he's saying, as we understand that very soon we're either going to hit the dirt dead or Jesus is going to come back, we should view these things in our life way differently than we have been. And so if you have a pen, I'm going to put these on the screen. I put them all in M's for you so you could remember them, okay? Here's the categories. You ready? Here we go. There's five of them. The brevity of life should change five things, all right? The brevity of life should change five things. Number one. The way that you view your marriage. The way that you view your marriage. You see it there in verse 29? You could underline it. He says, from now on, those who have wives, their perspective should be as though they had none. Some of the wives are freaking out. He's talking about the, the attitude and the way you view. Get this. Not what you give to your wife. Listen closely. That's Ephesians 5. You pour out your life for your wife. You married her. You lay yourself down the way Christ laid himself down. He's not talking about what you give your wife. He's talking about what you expect to get from your wife. What you expect to get from her. And you rarely hear this principle taught in the evangelical world anymore because we're, we're about family idolatry. We, we take the family and we put it up on a pedestal and basically we, we tell Christians, just build your entire life to protect the family. And Paul says, no, your marriage and your family exist to glorify and honor Christ. It's one of the dangers, by the way, of that term, first ministry, when it comes to family. It's your first ministry towards your ultimate ministry, but it's not the key ministry. Serving Christ is your ministry. So as a spouse and a married couple, your goal is to serve Christ. And the only way you'll ever have joy is if you're 100% all in committed to Jesus. Listen, friends, it's very simple. If you need marriage to be happy, then you'll never be happy in your marriage. Let me say that again. 
If you need your marriage in order to be happy, you'll never be happy in your marriage because the only good marriage is a marriage that is immersed in the honor and the glory of Jesus. He says, so even though you're married, you as a couple need to start viewing yourselves as on fire and devoted to Christ because the time is short. That's perspective. That's perspective. And that just hits every rom-com and every Disney movie right in the jaw that makes it all about us. It's not about us. It's not about us. Serving Christ is our calling. Marriage is our responsibility. It's our obligation. So it changes the way you view marriage. Here's another one. The brevity of life should change the way you view marriage, but also it should change the way you view, you ready, another M, mourning or, or, or weeping or sadness You see verse 30? Look at it there in verse 30. Those who weep as though they did not weep. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what that means, okay? All right, up here, you ready? We live, tell me if I'm wrong, in a comfort culture. Do we not? What's the ultimate goal in all of our life? To be? To be comfortable. Like if we stub our toe, we go to Kaiser and say, what's wrong with Kaiser? They can't fix my toe. I mean, we have more drugs than any society ever in history. We have more opiates than any society ever in history. We've got Dr. Phil psychologizing us all the time on TV. We go suicide. We go euthanasia. People will do anything just so they don't have to feel the pain. And yet, what does a Christian know about pain? What is it? Come on now. Revelation 21.4, what's going to happen in heaven? Every tear and every sorrow is going to be forever what? So where does pain end? Here? Where does it end? Okay, now 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, and our momentary light pain prepares for us what? An eternal weight of? So God actually gives us our pain here so that one day we can be prepared to what? Bring him greater glory. Our pain is not a bad thing. It's a useful tool in the hands of a mighty God. You see the difference there? So he says, those of you who are weeping, you don't need to act as if you're weeping. You need to act as if you're joyful, trusting that God has your weeping there for a plan and for a purpose. Even your pain is being used by the Lord with a specific reason and a specific purpose. Who knows Aaron and Chrissy Smith? You know Aaron and Chrissy? You remember last year when baby Noah died? So here she is. She goes in full term to deliver life, and she ends up delivering death. And I, I honestly can't tell you how many times this last year I've heard Aaron say, when I ask him, how you doing? He says, I'm just thankful and rejoicing at how often the Lord is using my son's death to glorify himself. That's a man who even as he weeps does not weep because he knows that God has a plan for his sorrow. See, number one, when you look at the brevity of life, it changes the way you view marriage. Number two, the way that you view your sadness or your mourning. Number three, how about this one? The way that you view even your joy, your merriment, your merriment. There's another M for you. Look at verse 30. Look at this. He says, those who rejoice as though they did not what? As though you didn't rejoice. That sounds kind of like Eeyore to me. Wah, wah. But that's what he's saying. Just as the brevity of life tempers our sorrow, it tempers our pleasure too. Because the Corinthians were pleasure seekers and living for the weekend, the next hit, the next high, it always fell flat and never satisfied. By the way, have we all learned that by now? You just can't get there? You go after the next pleasure and the next pleasure and the next pleasure, it never satisfies, it doesn't work, right? That was the story of, uh, of Augustine. That was Augustine. He was a pleasure seeker. He was a thrill seeker. He was a party animal. And he's the one who said that I I tried to find my pleasure in the arms of drink. I tried to find my pleasure in the arms of women. And then I finally came to the realization that I only could find lasting pleasure in the arms of God. There's just no pleasure in any of it. So he says, when you're sad, then you realize I've got perspective. But even when I'm pleasure, joyful, ecstatic, euphoric, I still have balance. Which is why old mature saints, by the way, are even keel. Have you ever noticed that? When we're young in the faith, what do we do? Oh, it's so hard. I just hate life. God doesn't love me no more. I hate it all. And then a day later, woo! It's all perfect. This is awesome. And we go from here to here. We're like Christian teenagers, right? Sorry, no offense. 
as you get older in the faith, you realize, no, 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 I don't need to be down here because God has a plan. And I also don't need to be up here because God has a plan. And I can trust him. All right? Be sober-minded. See, the brevity of life changes the way I view marriage, the way I view my, my mourning, the way I view my merriment. How about this one, verse 30? The way that we view our materials, our money. You see that in verse 30? Those who buy as though they did not what? You quit on me already? Are you angry with me? Sorry. Teenager comment. Was that it? That was it? <laughs> Sorry, Kira. I love you. All right. Here we go. Those who buy as if they did not own. Show of hands. Who owns a home? No, you don't. <laughs> who owns a car? Not leasing. Owns their car. No, you don't. That was in our Bible reading just, just recently. Remember in Deuteronomy 3 and 4, God takes them into the land, and what does he do? He's like, hey, the Edomites are over there. I put them there. The Ammonites are over there. I put them there. This is going to be your spot in Canaan. I'm going to put you here. And by the way, don't you dare step over this boundary. Why? Because I'm in charge of all of it. Jesus was constantly, when he was on earth, trying to get people to understand the fact, the truth, that they don't own anything. Everything that you wear, everything you drive, everything you hold on to, it's all going to be used up, worn out, and eventually stolen or burned up by the Lord himself. You don't own it. And the brevity of life helps us to see that. And let's just be honest, right? Right now, uh, I've told you, when I die, you know, very soon for all of us, the heart monitor is going to go to flatline. Do, 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 Right? And then they're going to wheel us out in a cold, cat, cold gurney, or I'm going to be a cold corpse on a gurney, and then they're going to put me in a box, and they're going to bring me in here. Because I told Bree, I said, I want to have a funeral, and I want to have an open casket funeral, and I'm going to lay there, and all I want is my Bible in my hand. And I, want, I told Bree, I said, you make sure everybody has to walk by and then look at me. I might actually have them put my, the mortician put my eyes open just to freak you out. I told my kids that. There was a funeral here a year ago. My little son, you know, he's, he's like first grade. And I said, I want you to go up and I want you to look at dead guys. I want you to look at a dead person. Because we don't, we don't think about death. It's only a matter of time in a crowd this size. You, you guys are on your way out. One of us is on our way out. It's going to happen. And you can take all the money in the portfolio and you can pile it there in your casket like King Tut. And it ain't coming. It is literally, boom, I'm dead, it's over, and then boom, I'm standing before the Lord and giving an account, and I am naked. There is nothing from this world that's coming. So stop acting like you own it. See, the brevity of life changes perspective. Here's one more there. Look at it there in verse 31. It changes the way you view your marriage and your mourning and your merriment and your materials, your money, and the way that you view even your overall life management. Look at verse 31. Those who use, who steward the world as if they don't make full use of it. Even as they're stewarding their time on planet earth, they're not taking this world seriously. There's something bigger going on in their mind. That's a great word, use, by the way. It implies we're just stewards. It implies that we've been given everything we have to make a choice. And that one day the boss is going to come back and he's going to ask how we did. I like to call it an EIA, an internal investment account. Not an IRA, but an EIA. Jesus says that one day you're going to stand before me. I give you a little bit of time and a little bit of money, and then I'm going to ask you how you did. Did you steward it for my glory, yes or no? And we're going to have a chat about that, he says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, the author says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't want the kingdom of Egypt. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Here's the key. For he was looking to the reward. Hey, Ramses, you can keep it all. I, I, I don't want it. I want to roll with the people of God because I'm looking forward to the, the eternal reward. You keep your gold. You keep your silver. You keep your titles. That's perspective. That's perspective. 
So Paul was not a romantic when it came to marriage. And Paul also saw life through eternal glasses. He, he literally would look around and he didn't, he didn't see the way humanity does down here. He saw the bigger picture. And he knew that when the Lord returns, it would hit all of us. That this was never about the weddings and the sex and the cars and the homes and the travel and the retirement. The moment the Lord splits the sky or you die, you're going to realize that only one thing ever mattered. Only one thing ever mattered. Now finish it with me here. We've got, he's viewing marital status in the light of the distress and then the duration. And then one more here. He finishes with viewing marital status in light of devotion, in light of devotion. Just all out purpose for the Lord. All right, in verse 32, he says, I want you to be free from concern. And if you have a pen there, underline that word concern. That's very important. Very, very important word. Five times it's going to pop up. It just means your focus. I want you to be free. And then he explains, one who is unmarried, a guy who is unmarried and single, he's concerned, he's focused about the things of the Lord and how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, specifically how he may please his what? All right, finish it with me. Happy wife. See, that started with Paul. You didn't know that. That's in the Bible right there. Okay, verse 34, and because of that, his interests are what? Yeah, conflict of interest. Now he flips it. And the woman who's unmarried and single, virgin, is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, meaning set apart both in body and spirit for the Lord, but one who's married is concerned about the things of the world and how she may please her what? Her husband. Verse 35, and this I'm saying for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you. You can do whatever you want with this, but to promote what is beautiful and to secure. Here's the key, undistracted devotion to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with having a husband or wife. Pleasing your husband or wife, you should. But single people can do more for the kingdom of God. It's a pretty obvious point. John Stott, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Corey Ten Boom, Gladys Allward, Henrietta Mears, C.S. Lewis, Robert Murray McShane, the Apostle Paul, traveling the breadth of the Roman Empire. You can't do that with toddlers. Doesn't work. You only can do that if you're, if you're single. Pretty obvious point. Then look at verse 36. Here, finish this with me. I'll go real fast. He talks to all the dads who are trying to figure out what to do with their little girls. He says, if any man, any dad, thinks that he's acting unbecomingly towards his, his single daughter, if she should be of full age, she's growing up, and it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He doesn't sin, let her marry. Because remember, the dads are going, well, I came out of that pagan world and all that sexual sin. I don't want to take my little girl now as a Christian and throw her into it. What do we do? We just keep her at home and, and put a little bonnet on her and have her serve the Lord? Or should we let her get married because she's wanting to get married? What should we do? Verse 37, but he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided that in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, his own daughter single, he will do well. So he says you can let her get married, you can keep her at home, both are good options. So then both he who gives his own single daughter in marriage says well and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. He says, man, you might be freeing her from a lot of pain if you keep her at home. I'm going to take that verse and talk to my daughter about it. So you see what Paul said. It might be good to keep you at home, Right? He says, if she wants to get married, let her. If you want to keep her at home so she doesn't have to walk in this pagan world before the coming distress, that's okay. Either one's fine. And look at verse 39. He moves to the widows. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she's free to be married to whom she wishes, only that he's a Christian. But in my opinion, she's happier, that widow, if she remains as she is, and I think that I also have the Spirit of God, meaning I think the Spirit of God would support me on that. All right, so let's go ahead now in the time that we have left in five minutes. Let me try to encapsulate, you ready? All of chapter seven for you. So if you got a pen, just put these in your margin. I'm gonna try to take all of chapter seven and boil it down to four points. This was hard, it was a lot of work. So be patient with me here, all right? Here we go. I'm gonna do this in five minutes. Number one. And we'll put these on the screen. Marriage is not the solution to your problems. God is. 
First big takeaway from, from chapter 7. Marriage is not the solution to your problems. God is. Now, marriage is a blessed gift, yes. I love my wife. I think I get to be married to the greatest woman in all human history. And, and, and Proverbs 31.10 says her worth is far above jewels. Amen and amen and amen. But listen, but if God's not the center of your marriage then it just creates way more problems than it ever solves. Because all you're doing is taking two sinful, self-centered people and putting them together so they can find a way for 50 years to manipulate, use, and abuse one another. If you're not happy... without marriage, then you're never going to be, be happy because of your marriage. It's only a marriage that's immersed in Jesus that brings joy and satisfaction. Which leads to, um, to number two. If you do marry, it's not for happiness, it's for what? Okay, we'll put it on the screen. It's for holiness. It's for holiness. It's what that young couple told me when they got back from their honeymoon. Listen, friends, don't marry someone for personal satisfaction. Marry someone who will help you serve Christ better. And the idea that you can, that you get married to settle down and to find a big house in suburbia and have two cars and crank out 2.5 kids, maybe now 1.8, and then travel on vacations all the time, and then maybe get to church once a month, is an utterly worldly view of marriage. Because marriage, you should come together and say, we're, we're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all the other stuff is going to be added. Now, 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 please, let me press this into you. Very honestly, as, as clearly and kindly as I can, okay? The last two years, I, I have talked with man after man after man who has packed up his family and taken off from California because he believes that there's a place out there in the country that's going to satisfy his soul, And now two years in, guess what? I'm starting to get the phone calls back. You were right, they say. It's all falling apart, they say. There is no solution out there. And if you're not content in Christ here, you will not be content anywhere. So number one, marriage is not the solution to your problems. God is. And number two, if you do marry, it's for holiness, not happiness. Here's a fun one. You ready? Number three, single people. If you're single, thank God for the gift of your singleness. We don't talk about that at churches enough. Poor single people. I feel for you. In the evangelical church, you, you're always kind of treated as like a fifth wheel. You, you know what I'm talking about. These poor guys come up, they're like, man, there's ministry for pears, and I'm one of the spares. <laughs> By the way, that was an actual name of a real church ministry, pears and spares. <laughs> Be funny if it wasn't so sad. <laughs> oh, I'm one of the spares. Reminds me of the old story, did you hear of the, the lady who was turned 35, and she just desperately wanted to be married, you know, and everyone was telling her she had to get married, and so she went out on her birthday, and she, all the people left the celebration, she went out into the woods to pray, and she was crying out to God, and then I guess an owl, you know, walked out on a tree or whatever they do, um, and, and the owl started making it sound, who, 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 and she was startled, she thought it was Jesus, she looked up and she said, anybody, Lord, anyone, have you, you heard that? Okay. I'm sorry. So sorry. Who, who? You got, okay. She just got it right now. That's great. He just got it. 
Jonathan Chapman was a, um, is, is a well-known Christian author, and he would go to his church. This is a true story. He would go to his church, and older people would sometimes take him for a walk and say, hey, can I talk to you? And he would say, yeah, what's going on? And then they, they would say, well, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? you know, how come you're a successful Christian man? You, 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 you're touching the world in great ways. How come you're not married? You know what he started to say to them? He started to say, well, how come you haven't read your Bible? Do you like that one? <laughs> See, they, they say, Jonathan, how, how come you're still single? How come you're not married? He'd say, well, how come you haven't studied your Bible? If you're single, listen, this is the one little time in your entire life where you can go all in for Christ, all your time, all your money, all your focus, count the cost, and use it for Jesus. Because the pressures are coming when you get married. Which leads us to the last one. Marriage isn't the problem or the solution to the problems. God is. If you do marry, it's for holiness, not happiness. Thank God for the gift of your singleness. And this is for everybody. Ready? Keep your eyes on the prize of heaven. My wife absolutely hates when I say this. But I warned her last night that I was going to have to this morning, okay? And ladies, I love you. And I know if you, if you love your husband, you won't like when I say this. But guess what? <sighs> We're all about to be single forever. Right? Is there any marriage in heaven? Nope. Why? Who's there? Do you feel lonely ever again? Do you need a teammate? Need a back rub? No? Why? Who's there? Come on. All the lasting love flows from Christ. An unending joy flows from Christ. And eternal comfort flows from Christ and endless purpose and endless delight and satisfaction and ministry and every tear and every sorrow and all loneliness are going to be forever gone. So whether you're single or whether you're married, you set your eyes on the prize of heaven and everything else is going to be fine. It's perspective. It's perspective. It's perspective. If you want to shoot down the disease of discontent, that's how you do it. You think more deeply upon the brevity of life and the promises of heaven to come.